So what we hope to do today then with our presentation is to give you some, just some highlights of Ottawa County history. And these are things that our research team has, uh, there are things that they've uncovered that like we never knew before. There are things that uh, are particularly interesting about the county. Just sort of a potpourri of, of interesting facts that highlight how wonderfully diverse the county is. And um, uh, we will have, after we have our five presenters, Patrick will um, introduce or, or introduce you to um, the, the entire research team um, so they can, they can be recognized. But I want to I want to recognize Patrick, and um, I just told him a little bit ago. Um, he said, "I don't know why I volunteered for this," and I said, "Well, <laughs> the problem is you never were in the military, and you didn't learn how to never volunteer for anything." <laughs> um, uh, we had we had I remember the initial meeting. Paul Moon says, "Boy, you know we really ought to do this book, and uh, but we need somebody to run the thing," and Patrick gets up. You know, and I'm just kind of, oh no. <laughs> um, and, um, but, but what, a, what a, a good decision it was because um, Patrick has taken the lead and not only has he ramrodded the entire project, but he, he took it upon himself to basically write the book. And, um, you know, for those that have never authored anything or written a book or written articles um, that don't understand how terribly difficult writing is, um, you'll appreciate what an effort that is because they think we ended up with, what, 50,000 words, Patrick? Um, and, you know, so to do all that, that's an immense task. So um, I, w I want to recognize um, our own Patrick O'Keefe for. So before I introduce our first presenter, um, so after the, the five have spoken, Patrick's going to get up and he's going to talk about the book, how you can pre-order a copy if you want to, and, and talk about the people involved in the project and so forth. So, so we're going to get into it and we're going to need to, I think, close the windows a little bit. Um, you folks in the back are going to need to let us know if you can see the screen, if it's loud enough, this kind of thing, so we can tweak as as we need to. So our first our first presenter and uh, member of our research team is Meredith Beck. I'm another typical example of what possessed you to say yes, you would do that. You know, I never imagined a group this size or such notable people in it, uh, probably who know so much more than I do. But in any event, I'm going to talk about the Great Black Swamp, which was one of the uh, areas in the book that I agreed to take on. Um, so now, if I, I've never done a PowerPoint presentation, isn't that wonderful? Um, this is a little map of the area covered by the Great Black Swamp. Um, as you can see, uh, it covered literally the entirety of Ottawa County with the exception it's a little in error. It didn't cover Catawba or Marblehead because those are up higher limestone outcroppings. But the entire rest of our county was covered by this swamp. Um, in total, all the way over through the other counties, it was 1,500 square miles, which is almost a million acres. Um, when, the, when the settlers arrived in the 1800s, it had stood, this swamp had stood undisturbed for thousands of years. It was a flat and level land of towering trees and standing water. There was very little grade to this land. This is a, a, a product of the last glacier that went through like a bulldozer. And 
there was very little grade. Um, and under the top layers of the, the land, under the rich kind of loamy soil, was an impermeable clay. So the water did not run off. There was no, and it did not soak in. So there it sat, this swamp, for thousands of years, sometimes wetter than others. I think it must have dried out at some years, not others. But basically, it was a very formidable landscape. There have been several books written about the Great Black Swamp. I think several of them um, were uh, accounts by settlers who, who lived there, who settled the swamp and whatever. But it turns out there's a whole nother story to be told here, and this was the one that kind of captivated me. And that is the story of how this land was converted from this swamp to productive farmland in a mere 60 years. From about 1840 to 1900, with nothing but men and horses. And it was a huge undertaking. When I was looking for material for the Great Back Swamp, I came across um, a book. Uh, not actually a book, it was a master's thesis. Thank you to Google. Who <coughs> you can find anything with Google. But this was a master's thesis that had writ been written by a young man at Bowling Green State University in 1984. Uh, the name of it was Draining the Great Black Swamp. Um, and um, there was a copy of this thesis over in the uh, library at Bowling Green. And our library in Port Clinton got a copy of it. Um, and it turns out the student was named um, Pete Wilhelm. And he currently still lives in Archibald, Ohio. Um, and I was able to talk with him on the phone. He had been um, a zoning inspector, I think, over in, I don't know, is Archibald in Fulton County or? OK, and he had also taught at a community college over there. And I'm confident he was probably also a farmer and came from a long line of farmers. But anyway, he gave us permission to use literally anything from his thesis that we wanted to use uh, as material in this book. So that was wonderful, because it is a fascinating document, really. Um, so in, in the briefest of all ways, um, this conversion from swamp to farmland was really a three-step process. I am sure there are people here in the audience who know all this, but it was all new to me. I literally grew up here. I grew up in Oak Harbor. I never heard of the Great Black Swamp. And uh, how that could be, I don't know, but I never did. Um, but. It's new to me, and if you all know this already, just bear with me, it won't take too long. Um, the first thing they had to do was clear the land. Ah! Please look at the size of the log. And look that it's drawn on a horse-drawn wagon. Because when I said this was all done by men and horses, and it was no small task. This photograph came from um, the Historical Museum in the library in Oak Harbor. In the, uh, or in, yes, in the library in Oak Harbor. And I looked at that and I thought, oh, for crying out loud, how did they do that? Um, the clearing of the land um, gave rise to what was really a significant lumbering industry, which we've, most of us, heard about. You know, I think there's a little sign at Oak Harbor from this port, lumber was shipped all over the world, and so forth. There were the rise of many um, sawmills. Does anybody remember the sawmills? I vaguely do, that when I was a kid, there were still numerous sawmills in the county. Um, so that was the first thing that they had to do, was clear this land 
Um, and that was not obviously a small thing. The second thing that had to be done was draining the land. And this required ditches. When I grew up, every road that I traveled had a ditch. I thought every place in the world, every road in the world had ditches. This just seemed like the way a road was to me. Um, but it's not true. We have ditches, and we have ditches because of that swamp. And that is how they drained the surface area of the swamp. There was something called the Ditch Law in Ohio of 1859, and that law enabled um, and authorized construction of open surface ditches. Um, and these ditches were laid out by the county engineer and the surveyor, and a surveyor. Um, and the landowners were assessed for the cost of the ditch digging. We're still with men and horses here. Um, the work was contracted out to men and horses in um, one half mile lengths. And by the year 1880, this is not good lighting, there were drainage ditches on, or road ditches as they were called, on most of the sections of the swamp. So the first drainage law, drainage ditch laws, 1860, more or less. And in 20 years, they had ditched that whole area. I don't think obesity was a big problem <laughs> in that. <laughs> Finally, and the last, the last step was tile, the tiling of all of this. The ditches drained the surface, but it took tile to drain the groundwater underneath. And um, they produced the tile locally. There was no shortage of clay. And often, um, it would be a sawmill, one of the many, many sawmills that would build a little kiln. Because they had the wood, they could make the fire, they could fire the kiln they could find the clay locally, and, um, and they made the tile. The whole idea of um, tile, I don't know if anybody has heard this before, but the, the method of tiling flat level ground came to this country from an immigrant uh, in 1821. He came from Scotland. So this wasn't something that we just naturally knew um, but um, by the time they got ready to, to drain this area, the idea of tiling to, to, um, to take off um, groundwater was kind of an established method. The first tile that they used were, was wooden. And I thought that was kind of interesting. And then I remember when they tore up the street in Port Clinton last summer, did they not come up with wooden uh, tile, yeah, so, and that's what they use. And then they finally came to the clay tile. Again, all of this was done by hand. Now this tile had to be, you had to build a trench, okay? A three-man crew could complete about 800 feet of trench in a day and they were paid $1.50 each a day to do it. Now, here it is. The miracle. Isn't that gorgeous? <laughs> this is um, called the Buckeye Ditcher. <laughs> and this was the first piece of machinery that was available for this work, to help in this work. Um, it was invented by a machine shop worker in Bowling Green, and he sold his first model for $700. It was three times faster than hand ditching and advertised that the trench would be uniform in size 
and the bottom perfect to grade. Because tile, I'm sure some of you know, tile, you don't lay tile level, evidently. You have to have a grade for the tile to get to the ditch. That is certainly not all there is to say about this, but that's uh, my allotted time. And, um, but when you look out at, if you drive on 163 from here to Port Clinton or from here to Genoa, it is flatter than a pancake. And it looks flatter, and it is flat. It is, it is a most unusual landscape. And it's hard to imagine how this must have looked not that long ago, really. In 1840 is when they set about doing this. And um, they cleared a million acres in 60 years. It's kind of like the tropical rainforest or something. I mean, it's just gone. And, um, and frankly, it's probably also part of our problem with um, uh, the drainage is part of our problem with um, the algae bloom and the farmland, drainage of the farmland. So if we could replant that swamp, <laughs> we would be good. That's it. Oh, 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 I have two things. I'm so sorry. Um, this is a copy of that master's thesis. And um, I'm, uh, we had this printed. I'll have a couple more printed. And there will be copies of this thesis in the museum in Oak Harbor, in Elmore, and one in the museum in Port Clinton. So if anybody wants to know, because it is exhaustive. And he's got little uh, drawings of the tools that they use to do this. It's just fascinating. The other thing is, this is a new book called At the Edge of the Orchard. It was written by Tracy Chevrolet, blah, blah, who wrote The Girl with the Pearl Earring. And it is about the Great Black Swamp, of all things. And it's about a family. It's a novel. And it's about James and Sadie Goodenow have settled where the wagon got stuck, in the muddy, stagnant swamps of Northwest Ohio. So I have not read it. Uh, I don't know if it's any good. I can't say yes or no to recommend it. But it's certainly local. And, um, and she certainly did a good job with the girl with the pearl earring. So maybe, maybe it'll be a good book. It's called At the Edge of the Orchard. <coughs> OK? Thank you, Mary. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Our next presenter is uh, not only a great member of our um, research team, but also the editing team. And last but not least, a former president of the Historical Society, Nancy Dunham. Thank you all. It's very nice to see such a big group here. Um, I appreciated Meredith's comments about driving along and seeing the ditches and and you know you drive along in your car and you things look the way they look today and you never dream about the lives that went into all that and you did a really good job of explaining that um, when I started thinking about what I really wanted to say today it was really just about that how well the first title of our oral history collection was how we got here what we did and the idea that uh, that somebody came here first, you know, and um, what happened to us afterwards, and all that time in between. Um, so if I ask you how you got here, you, the short answer is you got in your car and you drove down the concrete uh, highway, and you uh, uh, you came into a lovely federal wildlife conservation building, and probably were watching the time and the speed and, and thinking about things you were going to do this day. And the longer answer is um, thinking about how it was um, about 200 years ago when the swamp was like we just heard described, when it was those big logs that were here and so on. Um, when the committee uh, 
got together put together the materials on who was going to look up what, I said I'd be interested in Elmore because I know very little about Elmore. And so I became very, went over to Harris uh, Elmore Library to the, what um, Grace Lubke had uh, started or that wonderful resource over there, and Jen, Jen Fording who helped us. <coughs> Um, a lot of us with information on this and she gave me um, a nice little book that was uh, about that they had, they had put together on the eight on um, the hundredth anniversary of when Elmore became in uh, town incorporated which was 1851 because of the railroads but before that um, going back to the swamp the first white settlers in the area uh, came about 1820, and you think about the time frame, that's a few years after the War of 1812, and the, the county is just beginning, as Patrick researched, the county is just beginning to get settled around that period of time, and um, there are a lot of native Indians, not many people here before that, and the people were just starting to get settled. Um, and in 18, so, what history does for us, I think, if we could look back at it, is we really begin to look at, it broadens out our own lives. I mean, here we are living these lives today, and, and then all of a sudden we realize 100 years ago, 150 years ago, and so on, people were doing stuff around here that, uh, in their life, what they did made a difference. Um, so this little story was one of the things that came out of the book that Jen gave me. Um, one evening in the year of 1823, three men were drinking in a tavern in Lower Sandusky, which is now Fremont. By the way, I'm not doing anything with these pictures. Uh, what do I do with them? No, 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 just about, just about. Okay, so, uh, uh -oh. <laughs> So, <laughs> Elmore, as it looks today, uh, with the, the bridge and so on, that's probably familiar to you, with the rapids. The rapids are what's important, I guess. Anyway, in 1823, three men were drinking in a tavern in what's now Sandus uh, Fremont. They had come from Columbus in search of a purchase of rich farm, uh, farmlands that they had heard about along the Portage River. They had a map that showed the mouth of the Portage River where they were to ferry across and go upstream 18 miles. Uh, it was a frustrating trip uh, through meandering trails and they were very discouraged by what they found, the low level of the river, the insects, the density of the swamp. It was so miserable they decided to pack up their bags and go back. They went uh, first to Lower Sandusky, being uh, the closest settlement, to spend the night and start back the next morning. As luck would have it, they, had, they met a little uh, trapper, honey, a hunter, in the tavern, and they were drinking. And the hunter and trapper gave such a great account of the land uh, around, along the Portage River, uh, where the rapids were, they decided to go back and look uh, the next day, next morning, so they did. They went back the next morning, and lo and behold, they, uh, they gazed at the bottom land along the river in the sunlight and thought they had never seen anything so beautiful. The names of the three men were Ezekiel and Reuben Rice, for whom Rice Street in Elmar is named today, and Bennett V. Havens. And quoting from Reuben Rice's uh, journal, he said, what had changed had been wrought, not in the land, but in our minds, so we stayed. And so the fate of Elmar's um, setting at that date was indebted to the wagging tongue of an old trapper. Um, so, you know, it's, it's interesting how we make our lives, that's my point, really, we do our things, we don't know, you know what we're doing half the time, but it makes a difference, you know, in what comes next. Um, I wanted to say one word about um, Joseph Harris was another story for whom the township is named. He came as early as 1818. Uh, so the other person I was talking about was 1823, so this is a short period of time. This is 1818, and he came um, because he wanted to trade with the Indians. Now we're talking, the Ottawa Indians, we're talking about the swamp and the trees and the impenetrable, impenetrable uh, land and so on. But he, he was, the, I mean, people were here. They were, there were trading posts and there were taverns and such through, and there were some trails, although I'm not sure what, what that meant. Um, anyway, 
Um, he traveled. Uh, he. He traveled from Port Clinton to where he could cross the portage without a ferry, which was the rapids. It's interesting you had a ferry across the Portage River. But anyway, it, it, uh, okay, now what do I do here? Um, at, at Elmar, um, there were these, it was shallow because of the rapids, and that was important in the whole flow of the Portage River. Um, so that was one of the reasons that Elmar grew up the way it did, uh, that along with the wonderful soil it had. Um, so he, he built a cabin at what is now Elmore, and he died two years later. No one knows why or, or how much about him at all, but his name was Joseph Harris, and that's the, the township is named for him. Um, and then two more people came, um, and one of them took over Harris's uh, cabin, and the other one uh, built a cabin, and pretty soon there were six families, with, you know, maybe 1825 or so. And it's interesting that the first year, three of the wives died of disease. So it was really a, a really hard trip. And the story that I, that really grabbed me because of, you know, today, like I said, we have, uh, bo we have boats, we have highways, we have computers and telephones to communicate with, but in those days, you know, the rivers, were the thing, and and uh, you, uh, so okay. <laughs> um, what do I want to say here? Sorry about this. I'm. Um, oh. The rivers and these this first family, these first families that was so hard for them, and Fremont was the closest I don't know what town I guess you'd say, but I don't know how big it was, but there was trading there, and but when they they didn't have any mill in Elmore, so these families would grow their wheat, and then they'd have to get it someplace to process it, so they would um, they had to at first at least they got their stuff in the canoes, they went up the Portage River to Poor Clinton. They went, got on the lake, went up around Catawba and Marblehead, back down the other side of the Sandusky Bay and got in the Sandusky River, and that way got to Fremont and, <laughs> and traded their stuff, whatever it took, and then got in the canoes and went back that way. Now, I don't think that lasted forever because they did begin to, you know, form some trails and things, but that's how it was in the beginning. It does make you wonder. Uh, you know what life was like then. <laughs> so anyway, um, that's basically. I I think this has been a, a very very interesting project. This book, and the I think we've all been quite excited about finding out things we thought we knew but didn't about the whole county. So anyway, that's it for right now. Okay, and I, I'm hiding this mouse. <laughs> okay. Okay, and so our next uh, researcher to present is Sandy Zinser. Good afternoon. I'm speaking. It's a little short here. I'm speaking for Sharon Sprague and myself, as we were the team that worked ma mainly on Benton Township. And Benton Township is the largest township in Ottawa County, and um, the title of this program is Tusta Turbine. Let's start thousands of years ago. We heard rumors that Master Don bones were found on the Bittner Farm near Elliston, Ohio. Initially, we were unable to find any information as to when this occurred. But as luck would have it, we did locate the Mastodon tusk. This is 10 to 15,000 year old tusk was found on April 1962 along the Packer Creek and is now hanging in, a, in the residence basement of a family member. Beside the tusk was a painting done at the time by local artist Nelson Ostrike that depicts the massive elephant-like mammal. The Mastodon was a forest dwelling 
shrub eating, tree eating mammal and they were extinct about 10,000 years ago and possibly this was due to climate change and or over hunting. Currently farming is the major industry of Benton Township. The township was late in being settled and developed due to the dense habitat. Again, we talk about the Black Swamp. The Black Swamp was an area of about 50 miles wide and about 120 miles long that ended in Lake Erie. It took about 10,000 years for nature to build gradually. In about 50, 60 years, the land was drained and cleared for farming by our early settler ancestors. This was accomplished with much labor, half an acre at a time, until now we have one of the largest farms in the area in Great Town, the Fox Farms, which farms 6,500 acres. Initially the ground was worked one row at a time, such as with this plow being pulled by a horse. And now the land is being harvested with huge combines. Fortunately though, fortunately, though in the 20th century, the black swamp marshes have been preserved and protected as attested to here where we are here today at the Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge and the adjoining states McGee Marsh. And the future. In an effort to save our planet for coming generations, we are learning from the past. From the mid-1800s to the late 1930s, windmills in our area were commonly used for generating energy to lift water from wells. Now, we have their next generation, wind turbines, dotting the township's landscape and generating electricity, one endeavor that is paving the way for cleaner, safer energy. In closing, we'd like to mention how fortunate we are to have such great resources in our county. The Ottawa County Museum, the Carroll Township Historic Hall, the Oak Harbor Public Library Museum, the History Room at Harris Elmore Public Library, along with museums at Putten Bay and Lakeside. But most of all, the dedicated people who keep these going. With this in mind, we propose an annual collection day or days where residents of the county can donate stories, photos, artifacts to ensure their historic preservation and not being lost to time. Finally, Sharon and I would like to express our appreciation for the opportunity to meet the many wonderful and interesting people of this community and for that we thank you. Thank you Sandy and our next presenter is Janet Stevenson. Although this is a wonderful county, it is also a county that has to do with allergies, so I apologize for the way I sound. Marblehead Peninsula, a part of Danbury Township, has always been determined and continues to honor, respect, and feature the many historical aspects of this small area, approximately seven by three miles. As you may have read earlier in this week, Marblehead was chosen as one of the 30 most beautiful towns in the United States by Expedia.com. So not only do we think it's a great place, but other people do as well. And also important and to be discussed by other people are Johnson's Island Civil War Prison and the Lake Site, which was established in 1873, both of which are in on Marblehead Peninsula. This area is in, what is, in, is in what is called the Firelands, a part of the Western Reserve, which is in the eastern part of Ottawa County, from the Lakeshore West to Leitner Road. It was set aside for those burned out of their homes in the Revolutionary War Battle of April 26, 1792 in Connecticut. And the Connecticut Land Company was tasked to survey the land set aside for these victims. 
Benazia Walcott was one of the surveyors who came here around 1809. I'm going to do this out of order. Soon following the beginning of the survey, the first land battle of the War of 1812 occurred September 29th, 1812, here on the peninsula. Indians attacked settlers gathered, gathered in a tavern, in a cabin, excuse me. Joshua Giddings survived and later became a U.S. congressman. He had a He had a monument placed at the site, now Battlefield Park, in 1858 in memory of those killed in this battle. This is on uh, Bayshore Road in the township. The Marblehead Lighthouse was built in less than two months in 1821 and became operational in 1822. It is the oldest U.S lighthouse in continual use on the Great Lakes. President Monroe and Henry Clay chose this location to encourage travel west. Benazia Walcott, a Revolutionary War veteran, was appointed by President Monroe to be the first lighthouse keeper. After Benazia died in 1832, his wife Rachel became the first female keeper, lighthouse keeper. She served until she remarried when her husband replaced her. <laughs> the keeper's house on Bayshore Road was built in 1823, the second structure built by Walcott. Now under the care of Danbury Township, it was redone by the Historical Society as a pioneer house museum. The Walcott Cemetery is behind the house and is where Benazia is buried. <coughs> because of the suitability of the land for quarrying, quarries have offered a living for many through the years. The Clemens Quarry at the point in Marblehead opened in 1830. The Clemens family had come from Maine via Kelly's Island. Many more quarries were soon opened and they were combined later into the Kelly Island Lime and Transport Company. Many changes and improvements followed. Today the quarry continues to operate as standard slag and during the warm months a blast can be heard daily around noon to know that the quarrying stone is still being taken out. The quarries brought in a diverse population, and one family was that of Alexander Clements, who doesn't look very happy. <laughs> he built a stone house along the lakefront in Marblehead, and it is now a private inn. Lucian, a son of Alexander, and two of his brothers rescued men from a sinking ship that they saw from their porch. Oops, excuse me. They later received the first U.S. gold medals for saving the men. Lucy, in, in recognition of the rescue, Lucien Clemens was appointed director of the U.S. Life Saving Station, opened in 1876, a replica of which is now on Lighthouse grounds. After combining several operations, the name was changed to the U.S. Coast Guard in 1921. And Clemens Park is soon to be open to recognize the Clemens family, made possible by a grant from the Western Reserve Land Conservancy. All right, uh, this will be opened, I believe, this summer. This shows, the inset shows the first life-saving station. And this is the uh, replica that has been built and is about to be opened this summer. Uh, on the lighthouse grounds. <coughs> this is Erie Food Market, which was opened in 1919. It's the oldest grocery in the township in the same location and building. And I was just there this morning and they're still going quite well. <laughs> and it looks a little different now. The Lakeside Daisy State Preserve 
Park was established in 1987 to feature this rare plant that blooms on quarry land each May. This was because of the efforts of two women, oh, one of whom was Ruth Fiscus, who is shown in a, one of the daisy fields. Lewis Shepard lived his retirement years in Danbury Township. He is the only United States Medal of Honor winner to ever live in Ottawa County. He came here because his son was living in Lakeside. He received his medal for heroism in the Civil War Battle of Fort Fisher, North Carolina, and he is buried in Lakeview Cemetery in Port Clinton. It has been my pleasure and a great learning experience to describe this unique area and the people who have lived or live here. And I thank all who have helped me with this study. <laughs> thank you, Janet. And our next presenter is the indomitable Peggy Dibbian. a lot of stuff about that now how do we turn how do we turn this um, just use your that one next okay so I'm go first going to talk about Camp Perry now this is an early uh, aerial photograph of Camp Perry it's quite pretty small um, it was first authorized in April of 1906 by the General Assembly of Ohio it was um, built for training for the National Guard, the Ohio National Guard. Uh, when the men arrived to build the base, the Great Black Swamp was so thick and the roads were impassable, they had to bring most supplies from Port Clinton by boat. Then in 1903, uh, Teddy Roosevelt identified the need to prepare American citizens for the possibility of war through marksmanship practice. And a program was begun, which eventually became evolved into the civilian marksmanship program. Although Camp Perry was designed for the use of the National Guard, facilities proved to be large enough to accommodate the National Rifle and Pistol sh Championships, were for, which were first held there in 1907. Whoops, we don't have the photograph of the first, I, I, I realize we don't have the photograph of the first national matches, but it was one line of men shooting. That was it. Um, and until 1968, the annual summer matches were run by the regular military with the help of several organizations, including the National Rifle Association. And of course, 1968 was when there was all that anti-military feeling. Military backed out, for the most part, from running the National Rifle Matches. And though they do help, it's really a program of, uh, under the NRA and the Civilian Marksmanship Program is the name now. Um, in, 19, oh, in 1918, land just west of Camp Perry was purchased and eventually designated Erie Proving Ground to distinguish it from Camp Perry Firing Range. Now, how many of you have been confused about what is EPG, what is EOD, what is EAD? Well, I'm gonna tell you why you're confused. And you won't be any better off after I tell you. <laughs> but there's a reason. The Ordnance Department of the Army spent between four and six million dollars for the area and equipment to establish Erie Proving Ground as the Army's fourth proving ground. In 1920, Erie Proving Ground's name was changed to Erie Ordnance Depot, which served mainly as a store and issue point uh, during peacetime. Then in 1941, the name was changed back to Erie Proving Ground, while the Ordnance Depot within Erie Proving Ground was called Erie Ordnance Depot. Now this doesn't even explain why we ever refer to it as EAD, so uh, I, I didn't find that in there. Um, so according to the Port Clinton Herald and Republican of 1944, Approximately 70% of the mobile artillery used by the U.S. and Lend-Lease was proof accepted at Erie Proving Ground. 
Uh, from 1941, also, Erie uh, Camp Perry had another job. It was the reception center for the induction of thousands of military selectees. And at the end of the war, it also became the separation point for service members. <coughs> now, because so many people were coming through there, we had the USO. And this is Evelyn Misch with Bing Crosby. Of course, you recognize him. So this picture was taken by, um, we think, Willis Misch. So um, that was an interesting thing. Now, in 1943, we got Italian and German prisoners of war here. And those of you who haven't seen how many of these camps there were around the country, there were hundreds of them. And I'd recommend you stop at the museum. I'll show you the map. It's not in this book. But we were just one of hundreds. And this was a coordinator for the state of Ohio. And so these are, do you think they're Germans or Italians? <laughs> Italians, of course. They look very Italian. And you know by the next page, they had their own uh, cooks. So here are the Italians making pasta. I guess the Germans were making sauerbraten or something. <laughs> so they did not mix. They didn't get along very well. And at some point after the um, Italians capitulated, uh, the um, 1,000 members of the 323rd Italian Quartermaster Battalion uh, were on duty at the Erie Proving Grounds and were gave, given uh, another title, many helping with the rehabilitation of guns brought back from field service, and they reached a peak of 117 railroad car and truckloads in one day. So um, at the end of the war, of course, the prisoners returned to their home countries. Um, and just to jump forward in the history, in 1971, the 200th Red Horse Civil Engineering Squadron of the Air National Guard moved to Camp Perry, and that's what's most visible from the road with the red roofs. So that's Camp Perry. So, do you recognize this? Erie Gardens. So this, w this is the only picture we have of Erie Gardens, and I grew up I uh, lived there about 10 years. At one time, almost everybody in city council had lived in Erie Gardens, and somebody the other day referred to it as a project. <laughs> and I took offense. <laughs> and my sister calls it a slum, but it wasn't. It wasn't when we lived there, and s much of it is still not. But um, Where's it, it located? it's located on uh, Fremont Road, going out towards Fremont. Uh, between Fremont Road and West 3rd Street. So if you go out, you'll see these buildings that look like this. They're, they all were the same. Now they're starting, well, over the years they've made additions and some things were made by um, the city. Well, under the, the past mayor, they were trying to um, make some of these buildings not look the same with changing the exterior. So um, now these, many people want to say these were uh, military housing. Anybody who's been in the military knows this isn't military housing. Barracks don't look like this and officers don't live in houses like this, right? R right, Rich? Yeah. The officers' houses are bigger and the barracks are, are bigger but they have a lot more people in them. So most of these were duplexes and uh, the one we lived in was a duplex and then after the people in the other part moved out, it became one house. So that's how they started and they have some that are half the size. But um, it was recognized in many places after World War I that additional war worker housing would be necessary if we ever had another war and there were some studies done of the war workers housing. And uh, it turned out that there was many houses Many housing was, much housing was needed near cities, which were manufacturing, and then out in the rural areas, there was more weapon work done, which is what we had a lot of here. And so they built these houses for the war workers, and you had to go out to EOD or EAD or EPG, whichever it was, and um, sign up and uh, get authorized to get one of these houses. Um, then in, um, they, oh, they had built a hundred of them. They're prefabricated, came from Indiana. They were four civilians. And uh, the first purchase cost $280,960. And some of these 
houses that were built in some places, they did not put in sewage. I don't know where the sewage went, but in this town, in this town, I found in the paper uh, articles about authorizing sewage projects for uh, the projects. And so um, it was pretty clean. So it was named Erie Gardens. After the war, the homes were sold off. And in the museum, we have the original papers, uh, map showing people who bought it, written in, in pencil. And there is my father's name on one of them. They bought them in the 50s, mid 50s, and uh, they were sold off. And these were considered to be temporary structures. Well, you know, a lot of them are still going strong. So that is Erie Gardens. Now, we don't have any pictures besides this. Uh, somebody else and I are going to be out looking for some more pictures. But you know, the other place I couldn't, these aren't the kind of houses you run around and take a picture. This is my house. The other place I couldn't find a picture of either was Rosie's. So, you know, nobody's bragging about Rosie's. An old picture. Okay, so the last one I have is North Bass Island. Now, North Bass is the largest undeveloped island in Lake Erie. And it's less than two miles from the Canadian border. And there's evidence of glaciers there in the Dolomite bedrock. The first inhabitants came there in 1844, and some began growing grapes in 1850. Then it went along, was called the Isle of St. George, and I apologize because I don't have that information why it was named that with me. But in 2004, the state of Ohio purchased approximately 590 acres from Paramount Distillers with grants from the Department of Interior and state funds to preserve the island's natural setting. The, the o Ohio Department of Natural Resources operates these public lands as the North Bass Island State Park. But historically, North Bass was a vi vineyard, so they also lease acreage to Fireland's Winery of Sandusky in order to prove the, preserve the island's cultural and historical uh, series of vineyards and winemaking. And the last remaining one-room schoolhouse ha was in, on North Bass. It was closed in 2005. And in 2005, there was also a suit by an Indian tribe over the lands. I don't have the latest information, but they're claiming some of this land is based on treaties from the early 1800s. So that's not gonna be in the book, because I didn't have it till Rich sent it to me. So um, that is everything I have. So thank you. So as a member of this wonderful uh, book project, I think the one takeaway for me w in my research was the realization that um, Northwest Ohio was the last part of Ohio to be settled. And um, Meredith so um, wonderfully talked about how basically Ottawa County had 60 years of retarded development and um, and it was sobering for me to realize that, that 15 years after Ohio became a state, most of Ottawa County was still considered Indian territory. So think about that. 15 years after we were a state. Um, you know, everything west of Lighter Road, which as you heard was Firelands, was Indian territory. So that was just kind of brought home for me really how new we are as a county. Um, but yet, so so diverse, and um, you know, just there's just so much history there. We've only scratched the surface. The book will have much more, um, and so um, I want to close with um, uh, in, by introducing our the master of this whole project, um, Patrick O'Keefe.